speaker is Ayanna Gray. Ayanna has only been with us for seven months. She was in Queensland, Australia, before coming here, which I'm super jelly. Um, she was working, though, for a political think tank, the T.J. Ryan Foundation. Ironically, she has never seen a live gator. So we have to take that on as a personal endeavor to make sure that she sees a live gator. I told her to head out to Sweetwater. There are tons of them. Be careful. Anyway, please welcome Ayana. Good morning. So I'm going to give you guys a word to start things off. Just one word. Generation. Depending on your birthday, when you hear that word generation, you'll think of different things. You'll think about loss, war, prosperity, economic booms, different presidencies. But the common denominator here is that when you hear the word generation, you often think about legacies. But when I hear the word generation, and when I specifically think about my generation, I think about different things. I don't think so much about legacy as much as I think about potential. I think about power, and I think about avocados. I think about these things because I am part of what's known as Generation Y, or the Millennials. And what I want to talk to you all about today is who Millennials are, what they want, and why that matters, not just here at UF, but on the bigger world stage. So first, who are Millennials? There actually is, and this is contested, but there is an age range in mind. Does anyone have an idea of how old a millennial might be, the years they were born? According to the Pew Research Center, oh, according to the Pew Research Center, it's between 1981 and 1996, meaning that millennials are between 23 and 38 years old. Now, this is an important thing, I think, to start the conversation, because there is a misconception that millennials are those kids. People think that millennials are teenagers. That's actually Gen Z at this point. So if you have a teenager right now, they're not millennial, they're Gen Z. It's tricky sometimes when you've got the 22, 21 year olds. So an easy way to remember is millennials are avocados in Facebook, Gen Z is Tide Pod Challenge. <laughs> Someday there'll be a Gen Z presentation about how horrible millennials are. So obviously, hard to make general statements about a group that constitutes millions of people, but we can pick up on some characteristics that define a lot of millennials. One, millennials are interconnected, and it's easy to understand why they grew up in the 21st century. They're the first generation to grow up in the 21st century. They grew up in the age of social media. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, you name it. They grew up with this amazing globalization, this amazing um, ability to connect. So that informs their, their behavior. They want to share, they want to connect, they want to be heard, and they're used to being able to do that. Millennials are diverse. Now, this doesn't mean that millennials are the you know, first people to be diverse. But what we are seeing is that millennials grew up at a time when diversity was embraced in new and innovative ways. And it's worth mentioning that millennials themselves are a diverse group because, as I said, we've got an age range from 23 to 38 years old. The millennials who grew up in the 80s and 90s had different life experiences than those who were born in 1996 and basically grew up in the early 2000s. This is a diverse group. Millennials are conscious. Not the first people to be conscious, but they are conscious in a very different way. I think in the past, a purchase, going to the store and making a purchase was a transactional thing. A lot of millennials view a purchase as an opportunity to state character what they believe in, and what they don't believe in. Millennials are also philanthropic. And this is important because when you think about what millennials have grown up with, the presidencies that millennials have seen, the leadership, the economic crises that we've seen, the soft student debt that millennials have, um, it's really amazing. But actually, statistically, millennials are the most philanthropic generation of all time. And I think it's neat because actually millennials stand to inherit a $30 trillion wealth transfer. Trillion with a T. The money is there, it's ours for the taking, and we can get it. We just have to figure out what millennials want to get that dollar. So I thought I would share a rather personal bit about me. Something that I do in my spare time is I read and I write, and I specifically read and I like to write fantasy. I grew up with Harry Potter. But as a kid, I noticed that when I was reading and writing, a lot of the times I didn't see stories about people who looked like me. 
That was just the way the world was in the 90s and early 2000s for me. So as I've become an adult, I have made a, made a stand that I want to write more stories with magic and people who look like me. And one day, one afternoon actually, I tweeted about it. So for those who think it might be a bit tiny, it said, for years I believed that fantasy was not a genre for black people. Now I'm working to change that. It's so, you're, so if you're a black, indigenous, or person of color writer, especially when writing sci-fi or fantasy, let's connect. I want to boost you today and every day. Tell me about your book. I put my phone down, and about three hours later, I picked it up, and I was blown away. The tweet had gotten nearly 4,000 likes, retweets, people commenting from all over the world like, wow. And I was really humbled by that. And I'm sharing it to say, I think that the reason that it was so well received is because I tapped into two things that millennials are into. One, I say in the, in the tweet, let's connect. I'm offering to, in, to be interconnecting. Two, I'm celebrating diversity. I want to see more representation, and I want to meet more people who also want to see that. I also said that millennials, oops, that millennials are conscious and they're philanthropic. So behind me are some companies who I think have done a fantastic job and continue to do a fantastic job of tapping into millennials being conscious and philanthropic. In different ways, these companies have shown a philanthropic nature or a social justice nature. Ben and Jerry's up there in the corner, many of you may not know, they actually have done a lot with the environment and done a lot in bovine research because cows make ice cream. Cheerios was one of the first companies to feature multicultural and same-sex families in their commercials. Profits for Life, Warby Parker, Tom, these are all companies where when you buy their product, you also get the chance to be sort of philanthropic because they give a product. Nike, you know, made a lot of waves when they featured, featured Colin Kaepernick in one of their ad campaigns during a pretty controversial time in the NFL. All of these companies are tapping into something. Millennials want to put their dollar where they believe. They will boycott, meaning they will buy things deliberately to support, and they will boycott. They will not buy things that they don't support or companies whose morals don't align with theirs. I think if we can tap into this, we're off to a great start. So I've talked about who millennials are, I've talked about what they want, but why does that matter here at UF? Well, I can think of two reasons why it matters, but what I want you to remember is this, tomorrow is now. Tomorrow is now. Tomorrow's donors are today's donors. Millennials are donating now, and even though a big part of our donor base still you know, constitutes Gen X and the baby boomers, as baby boomers and Gen X get older, millennials are gonna move in to take that spot. We need to make sure that we are, as an organization, interconnected, that we're representing diversity, that we are conscious, and that we're basically making ourselves an attractive place for millennials to put their dollars. We also wanna think about talent management. Are we, as a university, making sure that we attract the top, the top leadership? Right now, millennials make up about a third of the US workforce, and that number is only going to increase as Gen X and baby boomers move into retirement. Are we making an inclusive environment? Environment. Are we making sure that we are connected? Are we reaching out? Are we creating a good work-life balance? Are we doing things to attract the top millennials to get top leadership here in coming years? So I've talked about who millennials are. I've talked about what they want, and I've talked about why it matters. The last and obvious follow-up here is, okay, Ayana, how do we do it? How do we get these millennials? First, we show, don't tell. I told you all a second ago that I like to write. This is something that I hear a lot as a writer. We show, don't tell. What do you think is more impactful when we say things like, oh, the University of Florida is increasing its diversity by 10% a year? Or when we show actual stories of people who came to the University of Florida from all walks of life and were able to come together in one community? We show. Number two, and I love this, we be tweetable and repeatable. And I wish I made this up, but I didn't. But you know, millennials are used to taking things in bite size and sharing it. I mentioned that millennials are interconnected. If we can find a way to take our message and our branding, make it concise and easy to share, we're off to a great start. And this doesn't mean dumbing down the message, it just means making it concise. We've all played telephone where a long message gets more and more convoluted. We just want to keep it concise. We want to emphasize urgency, and I thought Elizabeth and Heather were spot on earlier talking about giving day. Emphasize urgency. My dad has a joke with me. Um, he says, you know, you kids, you always want everything instantly. You've got no patience. 
and I think, okay, that's fair, but when my dad was in college in Atlanta, to call his folks in New York, he had to wait in line to use the dorm landline. That took 30 to 45 minutes. Right now, with the press of a button on my phone, I can call, I can call my, uh, <laughs> my fiance in Australia. So I'm used to fast -paced, a fast-paced life, and urgency speaks to me and many millennials. Lastly, we want to show instant impact. There we go. <laughs> we want to show instant impact. So you've caught my attention with a personal narrative. You've given me a message that's easy to repeat and easy to share with my circle. You've emphasized urgency. OK, I want to give right now. But where's the impact? If we can show that instant impact like we do with Giving Day, then we are off to a great start. So I know that when I say generation, you think of different things depending on your birthday. And I realize that some people, when I say millennials, no matter what, you're going to think about kids who spend too much money on avocados and not enough on real estate. It's fine. <laughs> but when I think about millennials in my generation, I actually think of hope. I think of power, potential. And I think about a group of people who are ready to mobilize. They're ready to engage, and they're ready to go greater. We just have to give them the opportunity to do it. Thank you.